Hello and welcome to another episode of Varsity 360. I'm Colombian sports editor Micah Rice, joined once again by Meg Wachnick and uh, uh, coming to you obviously from the First Pacific Financial Studio. Thanks again to First Pacific Financial. Like we always say, when you support high school sports, you support the community at large and that's obviously what they do with this arrangement. So we're thrilled to have them kind of as a working partner with us. Uh, but uh, when we talked last week, Meg, about what our theme for this episode was going to be, it was sort of, let's take a look at some of the football programs that have used this season to really set themselves up for future success as soon as next year. Well, the future is now for Seton Catholic. They are still playing. They are. Yeah, we, I'm not sure um, there were a, a lot of folks maybe outside of Seton Catholic that thought they would be in the Final Four. But here the Cougars are. Well, I think that was sort of our take on it is that's a nice story. Seton Catholic, they put together a really good regular season, gave traditional Trico League power Le Center all they could handle in their game. And we're going into the state playoffs, uh, you know, for the first time in program history. So it's like, that's nice. Uh, great for them. Something definitely to build on, especially a team that has just one senior. And so that junior laden, sophomore laden class, or those players are gonna take that and use it to grow and go forward. Well, the growth curve has been pretty amazing because not only did Seton win their first round state game, last week in the quarterfinals, they go on the road uh, traveling to Wenatchee to play a, a power from that part of the state, Kashmir. They don't just hang with Kashmir, the Bulldogs, and, and and eventually win. They rally. They come up clutch. They show the kind of a, a veteran poise that we didn't really expect from a team making its first appearance in the state playoffs. No, not at all. You talk about just the growth of this program. This program continues to grow week after week. All of a sudden now, they're uh, going up against a, a very formidable opponent, the mighty Royal Knights in the state semifinals. Obviously a program that needs no introduction whatsoever when it comes to winning state championships at the state level. Well, I, th I think we had sort of said a couple of weeks ago that Seton, well, for your first state tournament experience, you're you're basically taking in the whole you know, enchilada, the whole nine yards. You're uh, going on the road. You're playing a, 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 you know, a program that's had recent success you know, in a hostile environment. But now you're, you're going to go and play against the class of 1A state football. Uh, let's just kind of go how Dom, go through how dominant Royal has been. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, are not only 11 and 0 this season, obviously, they've only allowed 41 points all year, including no points in three rounds of the state uh, or of the postseason. Uh, they have outscored opponents this year for, uh, by an average of 46 to four, and their statewide pedigree is just unmatched in recent years. You know, when you talk about Royal from a statewide perspective, I think the, the, the one thing that comes to mind is just, you know, you look back like the 1970s Pittsburgh Steelers, right? They come out in the field in those all black and, and jerseys with the, the nice helmets, with the night logo, uh, just crisp looking teams. And just year after year, this program is just for a very small central Washington town, just continues to just dominate when it comes to small town, small school football. Well, they've won the last three state championships. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, then they you know go back uh, to four years uh, or four tournaments ago, we had the COVID year, obviously, right. but they, they made the semifinals. That stopped a streak of three state uh, championships in a row. So really the Royal Knights have put together back-to-back -back runs of three consecutive state championships, and they'll be looking to make it four this season, but they got to get through the Cougars. Exactly. So <laughs> this is the ultimate David versus Goliath matchup, right? We were talking before we came on air about just what we're going to be seeing this Saturday in Royal City, right? 11 state championships for Royal all since 96, six of the last eight class 1A titles. Seat Catholics only had 11 seasons of varsity football, right? This program started in 2011 as a JV only team, went varsity a year later, didn't have football at all because of low numbers in 2016 and made their first state playoff 
uh, this year wins our first state playoff game. It feels like we've been saying first a lot when it comes yes. to, to Seton. Um, I, I saw their their game uh, a week four in, in a in a battle of two three and O teams when they faced uh, Stevenson, and that was my first time their first four and O start in program history. And it feels like week after week we just continue to do the first with Seton Catholic, and here we are we're at the final four with the Seton Catholic Cougars, a program that is relatively still an unknown when it comes to to, to football across Washington. Well, uh, you'll be making the trip to Royal City. Yep. You're gonna you're gonna experience what that scene is like, and I want to get to that, but not before we talk a little bit more about Seton Catholic. Yeah. Uh, why do you think they have been able to consistently break new ground? What is it about this group that you think makes them believe in themselves? To you know. No, no, no uh, uh, hurdle seems too big, I guess is why. No, no, not at all. I, I think, you know, one of the things uh, has to be brought up is is what Jason Gesser, the associate head coach and offensive coordinator, uh, has done now in his second year at the program. If that name sounds familiar, it should be. Uh, he's a WSU legend, obviously led the Cougars to a Rose Bowl victory at quarterback 20 years ago and obviously leading a new set of quarterbacks or excuse me, a new set of Cougars, yes. uh, very young ones at that. But, uh, you know, his son is a sophomore starting quarterback, Colton Gesser, and this kid, nothing phases this kid. I've seen this kid now uh, twice play live, and, and one thing that I think impresses me most is – uh, he, he doesn't make a whole lot of mistakes, and that's what you need in a starting quarterback, especially someone as young as a sophomore playing on the big stage. But this team is just week after week, nothing phases them, and I think that's what impresses me most. They're coming in as the number 12 seed in the state playoffs mm -hmm. with only one loss all season. And they come in, they beat Kings, they upset Kings, they mm -hmm. upset Cashmere on the road in Wenatchee. They're playing with house money coming into this weekend. This offense, I'm, I'm convinced, cannot be stopped at times. Well, what's interesting is that sometimes in the 1A levels, when you have maybe a smaller roster, you'll have one or two guys that are your playmakers. Mm -hmm. But with Seton Catholic, it's it's like we, we look at how many of their players won, won our Athlete of the Week vote. It, Shout out to yes, Seton absolutely. for being the best uh, for, you know, tapping their their alumni and donor network to consistently get uh, get their athletes over the finish line in our athlete of the week votes, but it speaks to how many kids they have on the field that can go off on any given day. You know, one day it's Joe Calarami, mm -hmm. the next day it's Jacob Williams, the next day it's Riker Ruelas, the next day it's Ryan Stuck. I mean, it, 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 it's so many options that that team has when they need to make a play. And that's why you see them being able to put up 42 points in a state quarterfinal game. And we saw that against Kashmir. Joe Calarami had touchdowns, rushing, passing, receiving. Uh, Riker Rulis, you mentioned, had really the game-saving interception late. Um, that kid's had a tremendous postseason. Um, so you're right. You, you talk about so many of these different weapons. And remember, just one senior. Yeah. And so this isn't really kind of that one-and-done fixture with Seton Catholic. This is a program that really we're going to be talking about for a number of years. But right now we're talking about them in the final four. Yeah, it goes back to the theme. The future is now for Seton Catholic. And so Seton Catholic's going to get on their bus. They're going to travel to uh, basically a place in the state where I don't know if you were trying to write a script for the Friday Night Lights small town the everybody comes out and it's the biggest game in town. You would you would go to Royal City, and for those of you who maybe uh, are 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 looking at a map of North Central Washington, or I guess in this case Central Washington, very mm -hmm. often because it's you you take your finger and you put it right almost in the middle of the state. You're gonna you're gonna come pretty close to Royal City, but there isn't a whole lot around it. You have to go. Uh, it's south of Moses Lake. It's kind of in that uh, uh, area of the state where it's the scrubland and, and you know, you're not quite to the Palouse yet, but uh, uh, you find on a Friday night in Royal City, I, I'm, it, it's, it's, it's a big time uh, high school football environment. Absolutely, and that's something I'm, I'm looking forward to. This is a town of fewer than 2,000 residents, a town that supports its schools, supports its Royal Knights, not just in football, but in all sports. This is going to be a tremendous atmosphere and, and something that Seton Catholic should really look forward to playing in. Well, and we were looking on, on Google Maps in this case, where you zoom in on the satellite view and you, you see the little town of Royal City and you see that there's not really 
anything but but uh, uh, you know shrubland and farms around it. But then you zoom in on the city, and it's like wow, that you can f- see right away where the high school is and those athletic facilities it's a community and a school district that is definitely invested in its facilities in its programs in its in its kids basically and so uh uh you know what 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 are you expecting as far as the scene the game day experience to be like at this point again like i said they're playing with house money right i mean here they are coming in as a 12 seed. They've made two upsets already in, in the state playoffs. I mean, you're going up against a, a very, a very difficult opponent. But, I mean, Seton Catholic has nothing to lose at this point. Absolutely yep. nothing to lose. I think it's going to be, a, you know, it's gonna, they're going to have their hands full, no mm-hmm. question. Um, Royals is, a, uh, Royal is a, a tremendous, tremendously well-coached program. Um, we're going to find out. We're, we're really going to find out. It's going to be a very frigid game, yes. uh, to say the least. So mid-30 should be the kickoff forecast out uh, in Royal City. But, you know, who's to say Seton can't pull off an upset? Or at least give them a game. Yeah, I, absolutely. You know, I, it's, we don't want to say there's moral victories. That's kind of cliche and everything like that. But uh, we talk about programs that are setting themselves up for future success. And I got to think every little step that Seton takes through this playoff journey is just going to build for setting those standards next year. And uh, I mean, I think we talked about it when the seating for the state playoffs came out and we we were kind of thinking, well, the center and Seton Catholic were seated sort of maybe on the on, on the lower side because uh, maybe the seeing committee didn't look at 1A football in Southwest Washington as being the, the, the most strong area of the state and maybe penalize those two programs with that. But the more Seton goes through this playoff bracket, I think the more respect it's going to bring to the football they, they play in the Trico Absolutely, League. no yeah. question. Um, you, you take out LeCenter, and Trico football really has no history in the state playoffs. Mm. Um, and so this is only going to help the league and help District 4 and 1A football moving forward. Uh, so you're right. I mean, previously, the, the teams out of the Trico only to make the state playoffs has been LeCenter mm. traditionally year after year. And so it's great to see another Trico League program not only get to the state playoffs, but make a run in the state playoffs. How do you think Seton uses this experience, not only through the playoffs, but what they've built consistently throughout the regular season? Uh, how do they, how do they use that for next year? How do they capitalize on this momentum? Well, we, we've seen this momentum continuing to build, right? You remember just, just a few, three, four years ago, this is a program that had just fewer than 20 kids out on the roster yeah. for the spring COVID 2021 season, right? They, they struggled getting kids kids out to just play a short, quick five game slate in the spring. So all of a sudden now, right, you want to be part of a winning program, right? Mm -hmm. Kids want to see that. All of a sudden that's going to maybe boost enrollment, right? At a private school, maybe that's going to boost um, just overall enrollment, whether or not um, they're football players or not. So kids want to be a part of a winning program. Well, that's right. They're not constrained by your normal school district boundaries. And and I, I don't want to read too much into it because you you still got to build your program. Yeah. You still got to coach those kids up. You still got to get them to come out. But if you're an eighth grader and maybe you're supposed to go to a school that uh, maybe you, you doesn't have the the richest tradition of football success, you might start to think uh, maybe Seton Catholic is a place I can go that is really building something. Exactly. Or maybe you're on the fence at one of the the feeder Catholic um, eighth grade programs and you're on the fence whether or not to go to your home high school Mm -hmm. where the boundary you live in or whether or not to continue your education at Seton Catholic. And, And maybe this season is kind of your turning point on whether or not you're going to go to the private education route or stay in your home high school boundary route. Yeah. So, so just, I think when we'll look back at it, if, if Seton Catholic goes on to, you know, put together a run of deep state playoff runs or, or deep st- state playoff teams and uh, challenges for the Trico league title year in, year out, I think we'll look back to this season as really the turning no point. No question. Absolutely. So we want to go ahead and look at, at other programs that really have used this year to set themselves up for what we think is, is future success. So uh, why don't we look at uh, the other team that was last standing last weekend in Skyview. Uh, Skyview, uh, along with Seton Catholic, the only other local team to make the state quarterfinals, uh, 
they had a, a game against Eastlake on the road that they were right in. And uh, uh, if few plays go a little different, we're talking about Skyview in the state yeah. semifinals. Absolutely, yeah. Skyview up on the road, up in the, the very, very nice area of the Sammamish Plateau, ultimately losing 17-14. This was a, a team that came out hot. It was 14-0 uh, all of a sudden midway through the first quarter. Two scores on the first opening two drives, and I'm thinking – boy, I, I think we should start planning for Skyview to, to face Graham Kapowson in, in the state uh, semifinals. But um, there, there were really two, two plays uh, really in the second half that really was the turning point, not only for Skyview, but really the turning point for Eastlake to kind of get that momentum uh, for good. One of them was actually a fake punt uh, to open the third quarter uh, for Skyview. Uh, Gavin Packer didn't get the first down yardage. All of a sudden, you're turning the ball over on downs to East Lake. Short yardage on field. Seven plays later, it's a tie ball game, 14 all. And the second one was the beginning of the uh, the fourth quarter. A forced fumble by Kellen Wiggins on the recovery. Again, great defensive performance all game by Skyview. And you're thinking, okay, this is the momentum that they need by the defense given a great field position by the offense. They get down third and goal at the one, and an unfortunate interception for the for the touchback. Again, the the turnover just it was just a momentum killing turnover. That was with nine minutes to go, still a tie ball game, and all of a sudden East Lake went on what was basically a signature game winning drive, mm -hmm. thirteen plays, seventy three yards on fourth and seven kicked what was ultimately the game-winning 24-yard field goal with 2.18 to go. Skyview did have a chance, marched down the field, down to the East Lake 31, and uh, unfortunately it was a turnover on downs on fourth and six. But just there was those those two plays really was, was kind of the momentum-shifting change uh, for Skyview in that one. Well, I got the sense reading your article on that game that Skyview really felt like this was their game to win mm -hmm. and, and bitterly disappointed with being so close to a state semifinal berth. But... Uh, uh, Skyview's not going anywhere. They have plenty coming Absolutely. back, including Gavin Packer, as you mentioned. Which he could be in the running for a league MVP if he continues to grow and progress in the way that he has. Not only MVP, but I think he's going to be probably one of the more elite recruits coming out of the class of, of, of 2025, just from the state of Washington. This kid, I don't know what it is about watching Gavin Packer, but I think the thing that impresses me most is he has this second-level burst of speed that not a whole lot of kids have, and he's very fortunate to have that. And I think a lot of that offense is going to go through him next year. The question is, who's going to be the starting quarterback with the graduation of Jake Kennedy? Yeah, obviously that's a, something every program of, uh, you know, over the course of a few years has to answer. Yeah. And so being with the sort of stability that that coaching staff and Steve Kaiser have got there, I, I, I have no doubt that the, they'll have some kid be ready to step into that role. But what you mentioned it. What really impressed me about Skyview this year was their play on defense. Mm -hmm. uh, not the biggest in the trenches, but incredibly aggressive linebackers and defensive ends able to really wreak some havoc on the pass rush. Um, how do you think that defense is going to look next year? You know, they, they yes, every program every year goes through changes when it comes to graduation, but Skyview is, is such a well-coached program, and, and they talk about kind of that next man up mentality. I think they're going to be just fine in that front seven. Um, Raya Poching comes back. Um, he's one of the kids I talked to post-game afterward. Yes, he was bummed, but he was one of those kids that was just like, hey, I am more proud to lose with this group of guys no question. And so he's going to be definitely one of the leaders coming back, playing all season um, since week three, I think, on a torn MCL in oh, his wow. knee. So I had no idea. And you, <laughs> looking at him and watching him play and his just tenaciousness on defense, I had no idea that anything was wrong in his knee. So he's definitely going to be one of those leaders on defense uh, for Skyview next year. Well, and then if Gavin Packer continues to be a both ways player, you know, he's in the, in the defensive backfield and that mm -hmm. kind of coverage speed to uh, really keep uh, an offense from opening up in the deep passing game. Yep. That that was also a key that really let those uh, linebackers and defensive end ends put their ears back and go after the quarterback. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. And then a final, you know, we talk about great players. Uh, one of the best players in the area at Woodland, Elijah Anderson, will also be back. And considering what Woodland did this year, they are our third team who I think really has set themselves up with what they accomplished this year to have future success. Uh, Woodland is going to come in as the defending league champions with one of the best players in the area next year. How do you think what 
Woodland did this year sets them up for future success. Again, it starts with Elijah Anderson, right? The question is, where do you put him on offense, right? With the graduation of Brett Marcinowicz at uh, not only quarterback, but also one of their starting safeties, um, do you have him starting at quarterback? Do you have him moving between slot and wideout? Do you put him maybe at wildcat? I think what led that offense so well for Woodland this year is Sean McDonald and that staff put him in so many different positions and different packages that was enabled to have Woodland to have that success that they had this year. And so maybe you keep him in that, you know, five different positions and, and various spots in the game kind of a player. But that's kind of the biggest question moving forward for Woodland right now. But, I mean, kudos to the Beavers. Best season since 2013, uh, reaching a round of state that they haven't been in in a decade. So um, they still, along with Elijah Anderson, Carson Northcutt comes to mind, another two-way all-league guy. Um, just a sophomore this year, not only at running back, but at linebacker as well. So there's a number of key pieces for Woodland coming back besides Anderson. Yeah, I mean, it could be very tempting to kind of approach next season as this team's going to go as far as Elijah Anderson carries them. And that very well yeah. may be the case when you have a a player as elite and game-changing as that but how do you think coming in as a league champion uh after this year winning big games against the likes of Ridgefield where you know it's week nine and the league titles how how do you think that elevates maybe your more your your role player type that uh, maybe we don't notice how do you think that elevates just the overall tenor of a program to you know considering what they were able to do this year yeah I think overall it just number one starts with confidence right it's it's having those confidence uh, against a program that maybe doesn't have traditionally the numbers that programs like uh, Ridgefield or Washington Google have on the sidelines that you can go up against um, and and do fairly well in a week nine league title scenario or maybe a, a week three scenario on the road where you're upsetting the defending league champions uh, in Woodland. So it, it starts with that confidence. And, and two, maybe it's getting those maybe other multi-sport athletes to turn out for football that maybe might have been on the fence um, before. Again, you know, people want to be part of a successful program. And in a school like Woodland, where they rely on a lot of multi-sport athletes, mm-hmm. a lot of kids at Woodland and some smaller schools don't specialize in sports. And so getting a lot of those multi-sport athletes, whether they're wrestlers, whether they're baseball players, to come out for football will definitely play dividends. In this. Well, and, and don't forget, too, it's going to be one year more uh, in in charge for that coaching staff. Correct. Remember, this coaching staff, this is only their second year. Yeah. They're, they're just beginning to lay the groundwork for what they want to be a pyramid of success there in, in, in at Woodland. Yeah, I don't, I don't see the Beavers taking a step back at all. Just like I mentioned about Seton Catholic being not being a one and done. I don't see Woodland being a one and done in this situation at all. All right. Well, you're getting ready to hit the road for a long road trip. Uh, uh, you know, enjoy the small school state playoff experience in Royal City. Uh, I can't wait to see the updates uh, if if you're able to get right, <laughs> yeah. cell service. Our, our correspondent in, in Wenatchee uh, uh, last week uh, it was was uh, kind of dealing with that, and so we, we weren't able to really get many updates. But assuming that you're able to get some videos and some updates. I, I cannot wait to see what that scene is like. I can't wait to see how Seton Catholic, the last team from Clark County still standing in the state put football playoffs. Uh, I, I can't wait to see how they represent this area of the state in that setting. In addition to being one of the last, perhaps, uh, uh, games of the fall football season, uh, Meg, it, it's uh, you're about to start a, a whole new journey. You're, you're not going to leave the Columbian, but you're going to go on uh, what what could be an amazing adventure to help some people in a different part of the world. Um, so we're not going to see you on the show uh, or, or out at the gymnasiums for a couple of months, but why don't you tell everybody what you have planned coming up? Yeah, so um, by the time this comes out, about a week from now, um, I'm actually traveling to a very rural part of, uh, of Honduras to um, go work with kids and teach kids uh, ages 8 to 12. And I will be there until the uh, early part of February. So you won't see me until um, probably the uh, the basketball playoffs get going. So it'll be a, a long layoff for me, but it's uh, it's something that I've been uh, planning on for a number of months and something that's near and dear to my heart. And it's a, it's a challenge, a very big challenge that I've got ahead of me, but it's something I know that would be very rewarding. Oh, I, I, I know just 
hearing some of the stories of your previous uh, trips like this, how much it, it means to you. But uh, I, I can't be a bigger fan of, of, of this. It's just awesome to go and, and help kids and, the, you know, expand the, your world and their world. Uh, what do you know about the community where you're going to be? So the community, it's, you know, obviously, you know, folks who know about Honduras, it's, you know, it's one of the, the poorest uh, nations in Central America. And, and some of the, the regions that I'm going to be working in um, are deeply affected by extreme poverty uh, when it comes to money and uh, educational inequities. And a lot of these families live on just a few dollars a day. A lot of these uh, families um, rely on um, an employment of um fruit farms and, and whatnot and to support their families. And so a lot of these kids don't make it past sixth grade. Uh, the community I'm living in doesn't doesn't have a whole lot, uh, doesn't have any paved roads. Um, and so, so this is going to be a, a very different uh, challenge for me. But like I said, I mean, this is something that it's it's near and dear to my heart and something I know I'm going to be better for it by doing it. Well, I, I got a small taste, not to the extent that you did, I, I are, are going to have. I, I got a small taste uh, in recent years when my daughter and I joined uh, a trip to the Dominican Republic for a, a, a local uh, nonprofit called Courts for Kids. It's run by former Evergreen basketball star Derek Nesland. They've gone on and built dozens of courts in dozens of countries around the world. Um, uh, we went to a rural community in the Dominican Republic and built a multi-use sports court um, uh, in uh, to see kind of what that meant to those kids and to have that cross-cultural experience be somewhere where only Spanish was spoken and be close enough to actually take a day trip to the, the border with Haiti and see some of that was, I think, really eye-opening, not just for me, but definitely for my daughter, who was a sophomore in, in high school at the time. So I'm just such a big fan of any sort of experience that expands your boundaries and gets you out of your little cultural bubble. Absolutely. I, you know, just me, me personally talking, I think if everyone could experience, you know, some third world countries and developing countries, you know, this, this place would be uh, a lot, we would be all better off for it. Well, I can't wait to hear more about it when you get back. So I'll see everybody in February. Uh, be sure to follow along always on 360preps.com and we will see you next week. <laughs>